and the supporters of, of these fine, strong, brilliant women. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge the women and their legacy that we are here honoring this evening. Ingrid served as a chairperson of the NGO Committee of the International Decade of the World's Indigenous People, delegate to the Commission on Human Rights and Working Group on Indigenous Peoples, founding member of the Native American Council in New York City, board member of the American Indian Community House, and co-chair of the Indigenous Women's Network and the New York City Native Women's Voice at the 1995 Beijing Declaration Process. Tanya, president and, and founder of the American Indian Law Alliance, served as the North American Regional Representative to the United Nations Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues for three years, chair of the board of directors of the Seventh Generation Fund, and served as legal counsel and board member to the Iroquois Nationals. Both of these incredible women were tireless activists that devoted their lives to the pursuit of human rights for indigenous people. The United Nations, the American Indian Law Alliance, the Seventh Generation Fund, Esmeralda Rao, President of the Southern Diaspora Research and Development Center, Tona Tiara, the American Congress of Obstetricians and Gynecologists, and Ingrid Washington-Wata, Elisa Flying Eagle Woman Fund for Peace, Justice, and sovereignty. I would like to introduce at this time our distinguished and brilliant panelists that I am so honored to work with. These are a group of people that are just so dedicated to this cause and effort. Our moderator this evening is Tia Oros Peters. Could you make your one? <laughs> Shibi Nation, Executive Director of the Seventh Generation Fund for Indigenous Peoples. Eve Reyes Ayer, Iscaloteca, Mexica Aztec. Co-chair of the Global Indigenous Women's Caucus and Embassy of Indigenous Peoples. Laura Miran Sanchez Benavides, the Integrated Knowledge of the American Community, Quito, Ecuador. <coughs> Dr. Brian Thompson from the United Nations, Assistant Dean for Diversity and Clinical Assistant Professor at Upstate Medical University in Syracuse, New York, member of the American College of Obstetricians and Gynecology, and member of the American Indian and Alaska Native Committee. And Dr. Eve Espy, Chairperson and Professor of the Department and Obstetricians and Gynecology, Division of Family Planning and Family Planning Fellowship, and Director at the University of Mexico an American College of Obstetricians and Gynecologists representative. And I'd like to thank you all for your time and commitment as well. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Ms. Tia Oros Peters, um, and she's going to moderate this evening's event. Thank you very much. 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 Oh, I'm going to see it. we don't have uh, microphones, so we'll do our best to project our voices. Um, I welcomed you with a good evening in my language, and um, I'd also like to point out our translator. If you're asking a question or speaking um, at a hotel, she may wave her hand later on in the program, so I wanted to alert you to that also. So welcome, distinguished brothers and sisters. Welcome to our esteemed colleagues, our sisters and brothers who have devoted themselves to this movement. And what we're going to talk about today is about self-determination of indigenous peoples. We're going to talk about the health and well-being of indigenous peoples with a specific focus on indigenous women and girls of the Americas. But it's not exclusive to that. In addition to recognizing our beloved brothers, Herb and, and all these, and our sisters, whom they carry with them still, I'd like to also recognize the Tadadaho, Sidno, who's with us this evening as well, a leader of the Haudenosaunee Nation Confederacy. So what is this that we're going to talk about? We're going to talk about like a progress report of the Beijing platform. I think it's been 20 years. And over the last couple of days, we've had an opportunity to begin to explore what that means. If you look at the platform for action, you'll note there are a couple of references to indigenous women and girls. Just a couple of references. Our goal here is to push that forward. 
recognizing that on the first day there was a wonderful presenter and her name escapes me. And she said, the platform did not go far enough. As, as our, our sister Betty said, Ingrid Washinawata tells Kiso with our voice, Native American voice, from New York City to the Beijing platform. She advanced our perspectives, our issues, and brought forward Indigenous women and girls' issues. And that got a couple of lines in the Beijing platform. So we have much work ahead of us. Today we will look at a venue, a unique venue, to discuss and focus on the role of Indigenous women and leaders, women as leaders in our nations and communities. So I ask you to take away anything you've learned in public school about Indigenous peoples, and certainly about Indigenous women and girls. And hear it first here. Pretend you've never learned that we're beasts of the <coughs> Pretend you never learned that we don't have a mind of our own. Pretend you never were taught that we were invisible, always quiet, and never had a role. We will discuss the need for culturally relevant and culturally specific health services for Indigenous women and our communities in ways that honor traditional health and healing practices which provides access to critically needed health services and which address our health needs with a gender and a cultural lens. We will look at Native-centered work to prevent violence against Indigenous women and the girl child. We are the among, among the most vulnerable and targeted groups, not only here in the Western Hemisphere, but across the globe. We will have the opportunity to illuminate on a number of best practices that emerge in several Indigenous communities and nations here in what is known as the United States, and that facilitates access and helps alleviate health disparities. You know, uh, Betty's already talked a little bit about Ingrid and a little bit about Tanya, but I'd also just like to share too that we have a, a, a unique opportunity to hear the echoes of what they've shared at the United Nations, what they put as a pathway down for us in Beijing what we've been taught through their leadership, through their inspiration, and for those of us who have the gift of, of being close with them, I feel their presence and recognize the echo of what they have put forth for us. It's a responsibility. It is a, an opportunity, and it is a privilege and an honor. They were diplomats, trailblazers, mentors, sisters, they exemplify courage and indigenous womanhood. They set forth a pathway decades ago. These are indigenous women who had decades and decades of experience. Leaders in the international arena of this contemporary time when, when really there were hardly anyone there, let alone indigenous women. And we stand behind them within their shadow and learn from them and their, their example. So indigenous peoples, of this Western Hemisphere, what people know as the Americas, what we'll call the Americas, and what we know as our homelands, the places where our ancestors first emerged and where they came into consciousness, who evolved our ancient and rich cultures, our unique languages, which are deeply connected and resonate with the landscapes of our creation, the natural world, our common mother, and her rhythms, and with the spiritual realm. Indigenous women throughout this region of the world have actually historically enjoyed very strong positions of leadership, power within our respective and diverse indigenous communities and our nations. Traditionally, here in North America, for example, many of our cultures are inherently matrimonial societies whose extended families, clanships, and tribal alliances form and are adhered to along our female bloodlines. And our relationships are grounded and not only recognizing, but nurturing the intrinsic power, wisdom, and value of our women. Often, great spiritual, cultural, and social power within our communities has been vested within our women and our girls. We recognize that we are inherently powerful, not inherently powerless. Especially our mothers and our grandmothers in our communities who hold honor and capacity as those who make decisions of governance and leadership, and who transfer essential cultural knowledge, protocols, and wisdom to future generations. However, the devastating and long-term impacts of ongoing colonization and the resulting globalization of our homelands and of our bodies and of our hearts and spirits have, over these many years, critically eroded the power of long-standing 
high status, and respect of Indigenous women and girls, sometimes even among our own people. Not only do Indigenous women experience the enduring impacts of historic genocide and its, uh, and its impact and its effects of massacre, of removal, of exploitation, and disenfranchisement, and the other assaults that are part of the ongoing colonization process. But we are also casualties of multi-generational grief and historic trauma that continues to resonate. Such anguish manifests in our communities and nations, and sometimes it's expressed in a high incidence of violence against Indigenous women and girls in our own territories and in our own homes, and around us in border towns, among the most violent places in the world, among the most violent places in the United States are border towns, and in all other aspects, such as Indigenous women and girls holding infamous lead in negative, and all negative socioeconomic and health indicators. So to share some basic statistics with you who love the numbers, let's say that pertinent to Indigenous women in North America, for example, Indigenous women and girls are more than eight times more likely to be victims of sexual assault mm. than any other mm. ethnic or racial group in the United States. More than one in three. Before the age of 18. And the majority, 82% of the perpetrators of sexualized violence against Indigenous women are non-Native men. This includes the targeting and victimization of Native women and girls and small boys through trafficking and sexual exploitation. For example, it's tied to the mining camps that you hear about that are springing up all around the hydrofracking and other mega extractive industries that are in devastating Indigenous homelands. Think about it when you hear about the tar sands. Think about it when you hear about the Keystone Pipeline. There are man camps that are springing up that are in alliance with these. And with them comes the exploitation of Indigenous women and children. Preventing such violence is critical to achieving gender equality, and more so, it's a mandate for social justice, not just for indigenous peoples, but for all of us, for humankind, and for the earth. There's a common Cheyenne saying that says, a nation is not defeated until the hearts of the people are on the ground. Historic grief, historic post-traumatic stress, and the impacts of social and economic injustice takes many forms and has many faces. This includes significant health issues from diabetes to cancer, heart disease, and a much higher incidence than any other group. And it's also found in major health disparities, particularly in access to culturally responsive and meaningful health care services. The experts today are going to share from their own experience, from their, from their years of knowledge and wisdom. They're going to offer very diverse, but also unified perspectives on the issues of violence against Indigenous women and girls, and how we can achieve culturally relevant and culturally specific health strategies. So we're going to start with um, our dear sister Evie Aguirre. She is one of the co-chairs of the Global Indigenous Women's Caucus, which forms around uh, the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, where we build a collective platform to advance Indigenous women's voices and perspectives.